the Capital Farm Credit Wednesday Night Podcast, our weekly look at the area athletic scene, what happened last week and what's going on this week. I'm here with my partner via Zoom, Dan Youngblood. And Dan, we're going to do a couple of things tonight. We're going to take a look at the Albany Country Preps volleyball team, and we're going to look at uh, some of the stronger teams in the area for basketball. Now that we're getting into the meat of the schedule, we want to take a look. Uh, we've got football and volleyball behind us. We're going to start talking a lot of hoops. We're going to look at the uh, the best teams thus far this season. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about tonight. Uh, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, we, we do want to touch on our All Big Country Preps volleyball teams, which we put out over the weekend, the first team of its kind for us. So we hope you guys enjoyed that. If you didn't get a chance to to read those, make sure you check those out. And then, uh, yeah, let's it's time kind of to, to shift our attention fully to basketball, which is always kind of a fun time of year when we get to do that. Obviously, you and I love football. We enjoy covering volleyball, but uh, it, it is fun once you hit that second semester and are kind of uh, kind of shifting your attention now to basketball. And we're at a really important point in the season. All these teams are kind of in the home stretch of their district races. They're trying to kind of establish their position in the, the playoff races and in the standings. If, if they're still fighting for district titles, uh, you know, they're, they're wanting to get key wins there. And, uh, and there are some big games still left to be played in the regular season. So a very fun time. And like you said, a lot to talk about. There's some pretty uh, uh, interesting storylines uh, being played out right now. All right. Before we jump into this week's show, we want to thank our primary sponsor, Capital Farm Credit, with offices all over Texas, including Stanford and Abilene. Buy your own slice of Texas with Capital Farm Credit. Together, we're better. And with that, we're going to jump into volleyball and take a look at our All Big Country Preps volleyball team that were released on Saturday. And we'll start with the superlatives. Uh, Dan, Liz Underwood of Clyde, uh, all six foot one of her, uh, is our player of the year and deservedly so. Yeah, well deserving of that honor. I mean, she's a, a girl, one of several on that Clyde team that are really, really strong players. And if you look through our teams, you'll see uh, several of those players uh, on, on one team or another. But, uh, but, but if you look at what she did in particular this year, leading a really good Clyde team in kills, blocks, digs, and aces, just an all-around star, really. She had 373 kills for the season, 77 blocks, 288 digs, 71 aces. You're talking about a six-rotation player at that size. Uh, pretty remarkable uh, story this year. So um, I, I think that she was a, a very deserving, very deserving of that honor for sure. And that brings us to our offensive MVP, uh, Kamaya Davis of Snyder. Dan, you're talking about a, a great offensive player, an offensive weapon. Not only did she have 268 kills, but she had 250 assists. She's distributing the ball and helping that offense. Yeah, and, and the, the assists were something new for her this year. She'd always been a hitter for Snyder. And this year, they kind of pulled her into that setter role in their 6-2 sets. And uh, like you said, did, did a tremendous job. So she added to her role. She was already, she's been a really good player for Snyder for a long time. And this year, she added even more to her plate uh, with, with those setting duties. And, and did a remarkable job. In addition to, to the kills and assists, she also had 63 aces, so a really good server. And then she's really good defensively as well. Uh, 256 digs, 48 blocks. So another one of those six rotation players that, that never leaves the court and is good at everything she does. So she's our offensive MVP, but she's another one that, uh, that, that was in, in consideration for the overall player of the year, just based on her overall impact. All right, that brings us to our defensive MVP, Callie Carter of Stephenville. And I'll tell you what, when you're getting 5.7 digs per set, and this isn't per match, this is yeah. per set. You get 5.7 digs per set, uh, you pretty well lock it up. Yeah, I mean, she did a, a tremendous job for the, the back of that defense. She was the District 6-4A Defensive Player of the Year, uh, Texas Girls Coaches Association All-State pick. And another uh, one of those girls who was, who was a really good player for a team with a lot of really good players. Stephenville went 26-5 and five this year, made it all the way to the third round of the Class 4A playoffs. Uh, and, and could have advanced past that. They lost to Graham in five sets in the third round. So – a really good Stephenville team, and she was a big part of it from that libero spot. So, like you said, 5.7 digs per set, that uh, I would imagine adds up to rough, probably more than 20 digs per match. So, a, a girl that's really, you know, she can really dig that ball out. She's a really good passer. She, she kind of helped set up their offense with her defense. So, uh, a very good player, and uh, you like to see those types of players honored, and it, it's nice to be able to, to, to put the, one of those liberos that, that, that does serve such an important role in that type of position. All right, our newcomer of the year is Kerrigan Parrott of Holly. Uh, 167 kills on the year, 189 digs, and she is only a sophomore. She's only five foot six, also. Yeah, a really good player. Uh, you mentioned the kills and digs. She also had 61 aces, so a really good server. 
31 assists, so she handled a little bit of the serving duties and then 19 blocks. So she did a little bit of everything. And that's something that you kind of see uh, fairly commonly with this Holly team. They've got several girls who, who do a little bit of everything well. And, uh, and Kerrigan Parrott's kind of the, the new one of those. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what she does the next two years. Uh, she's already uh, – I mean, she's already shown the type of player she can be. I think that uh, there are a lot of people who are excited to kind of see what she can do to build on this season. All right. That brings us to our coach of the year, MJ Renault of Albany, uh, who many people may remember as MJ Vickers, at, where she, I mean, she started as a player at Albany before moving on to uh, McMurray, where she became a two sport athlete collegiately. Yeah, I don't think this one is a huge surprise. The Lady Lions made the deepest playoff run of any area volleyball team this year advanced to the state semifinals for the second time in program history. But it's still interesting nonetheless. Uh, Coach Renault led Albany to a 23-5 and record. Uh, they they, they not, uh, snapped Holly's really prolonged district winning streak. That was a big deal for them. They go into the playoffs as, as the number two seed out of their district and, and make a nice run, win three playoff matches before falling to Crawford in the semifinals. But this, to me, the, the interesting part of the story is that she now joins her mom, Melissa Vickers, as the only Albany coach to lead Albany uh, to a state tournament, to the state semifinals. And, and they did that in 2008 with MJ as kind of the, the star player for that team. So uh, kind of a neat story there. MJ has been a part now of, of the two best volleyball teams in Albany history. One is a player, one is a coach. And I, I think it's, uh, this was a very deserving honor. She did a great job with that group this year. She had some really, really talented players and, and really – kind of kind of grounded them into form as the season went along. And with that, we're going to take a look at uh, the rest of our first teamers. Most of our superlatives are already on that first team. Uh, let's start with Daz Larkins of Cooper, Dan. 226 kills and 181 digs. That will land you on the first team, especially when you're playing at the Class 5A level. Yeah, I mean, she was a TGCA All-State pick at the Class 5A level, a really powerful athletic hitter for them. I mean, this girl can fly. She's been a she was a big part of their basketball team last year as well. Great athlete, uh, 226 kills, like you said, and also a, a sneaky good player on the defensive side. She's a, a really good uh, back row defensive player. She's she's uh, just a solid all around player. So yeah, I don't think this one. Uh, I mean, her coach called her a dynamic player. I think that really fits. I think that's a, that's a pretty good description uh, for Daz. All right, now we've got Landry Withers of Stephenville, uh, 5'11 junior, outside hitter. Uh, average three digs per set. That's pretty impressive for a girl that's 5'11. Yeah, and in addition to 3.1 kills. So she's another one of those that, that really uh, makes an impact, you know, on both rows of, of their rotation. So she's a, a really good player and, and one of those that uh, has some versatility to her game. So uh, that, that's, that's something I think you kind of see a lot, especially on our first team, is, is girls that do a lot of things well. And, and Landry Withers definitely qualifies there. All right, now we've got Allie Hill of Albany, uh, five foot eight senior, middle blocker. She was the district six two A MVP, uh, averaged seven point seven kills per match. Uh, pretty solid, pretty solid defensively, also. Yeah, another TGCA All State pick. Uh, Allie Hill was was a big player for Albany. She played a major role in their run, uh, not only in district but but later in the playoffs as well. She was the district six two A MVP. And, and really did a lot of special things for him. Another one of those that, that impacted matches in a lot of different ways. You mentioned the kills. One thing I thought was really impressive is uh, more than two aces per match. So obviously a very strong server as well. All right. That brings us to Clara Holson of Albany, one of the top passers, Dan, in the big country, if not the top passer, 23.4 assists per match. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just a tremendous job of distributing the ball in their offense, kind of getting their offense going. Uh, 23.4 assists, like you said. She's also a solid defensive player, 4.9 digs, and then two aces as well. So this is another one of those girls that was a big part of what they did. I mean, and, uh, I don't think Albany necessarily makes it to the state uh, tournament without a, a really strong setter, and that's what uh, Holson provided for them this year. Okay, our other starters, of course, Callie Carter from Stephenville, who we spoke of earlier, and Liz Underwood of Clyde, who we also spoke of, round out our starters. And we're going to jump down to uh, the utility players. Uh, Kamaya Davis, again, from Snyder, who we already spoke of, uh, was our top utility player. Uh, Brianna Leathers of Holly is also there. 403 assists on the season. Yeah, and this girl is only five foot five, but she is a remarkable player. You said you mentioned the assist. Also had 216 digs, 171 kills, 97 aces, and then 12 blocks to go with that as well to earn co-offensive co player of the year honors in District 6-2A and also TGCA All-State honors. 
Uh, this is a girl who's done a lot of really special things for that athletic program, not just the volleyball team, but but in multiple sports. And uh, I mean, you see here the type of athlete she is when you look at those stats and uh, just a, a remarkable player and, and had a remarkable season for a really strong Holly team. All right. All right. With that, we're going to go to our uh, reserves on our first team, uh, beginning with Peyton Warren of Clyde, uh, TGAC All-State pick. My gosh, 238 kills, 276 digs. And uh, she's a reserve player. How good is our all big country prep team? We have a player like that coming off the bench. Yeah, I mean, this is another one of those players that was a tremendous player for the, a really good Clyde team. You mentioned the stats, just uh, do, does everything well. 238 kills, 276 digs, 67 aces, and, and then the, for, for a district championship team. Um, I mean, you're talking about the district 6-3A co-MVP. Just, a, just a, a great player, did a, real, a lot of really good things for that team and was a really important part of that team. So, uh, yeah, just congratulations to her. And I think it, uh, as you see, as you go through this team and see as many of the Clyde girls that made it, it kind of tells you the, the type of team and the type of things they were able to accomplish this year. Okay, Abby Allen is our next reserve uh, on our first team. Uh, she's not just a quality basketball player, Dan. This, this is a quality athlete, and she's uh, she's good size. She's six foot one. Yeah, she does a lot of things well, too. Uh, 2.4 kills per set, 4.4 digs, almost a block per set, and then 0.6 aces. So she's a girl that, uh, that made her impact in a lot of different ways. And the one thing that, about her that, uh, that was kind of unfortunate this year is that, that Coleman was one of those teams that was really impacted by COVID. They had their season cut short in the middle of the playoffs. They were gearing up for what I know that they were hoping for, for a, uh, they were gearing up for what I know they were hoping was going to be a prolonged playoff run and, and got it cut short by COVID. But, uh, but that did not diminish at all the career she had or the season that she had. And you mentioned it. she's also a great basketball player. She's just a, a remarkable athlete for Coleman. And uh, I was glad to see her uh, be, able, be able to get that, that first team spot, just given how her season ended. All right, Cameron Williams from Wall is our next reserve on our first team. Five foot 11, and she's only a sophomore. She's going to be an absolute dominator uh, in the coming years. 8.1 kills per match as a sophomore. Yeah. Yeah, when you can step in as a sophomore and become the go-to hitter for a team like Wall, you know you're pretty talented. And uh, I think that, that Cameron showed that this year. You mentioned the stats, uh, over eight, eight kills per match, two blocks, so obviously uh, big on both sides of the net. And, uh, I mean, you're, again, you're talking about a sophomore that was the district offensive MVP out of 6-3A. So a girl did a lot of special things for him and has a big, big future ahead of him. All right, our next reserve is Sarah Beth Cotter of Albany, 12.3 kills per match. And some people, and this, I mean, she is arguably uh, a starter. She is arguably a starter. I would argue for her to be a starter, uh, but it's a tough choice. We have a lot of very good players. Uh, just, it was just difficult, a difficult choice. Uh, she makes the first team as a reserve. Yeah, these things are subjective. That's one thing I try to remind people every time we put out one of these teams is that uh, you can go a lot of different ways with these. I think you're right. There will probably be a lot of people look at her stats and say, she, she's, that, that's, those are starter caliber stats, and I would agree with them. She definitely could have been a starter on this team. But there, she had a couple of teammates on that first team with Hill and with Holson. And uh, really, I think one thing that may have hurt her more than anything, and, and again, being a reserve is not any sort of slight. But it's a, it takes a lot to be in the spot yeah. she's in. But uh, one thing I think that, that probably made it tough for her is that, that she played one of the one of the positions with the most competition of anyone in on, on this group. We got a ton of nominations at that middle blocker position and at the outside hitter position. So if you're on a, a starter or a first team or even second team, third team selection as, as one of those two positions, you, you've really done something special. Our first team's loaded. Yeah. Our first team's loaded. There's a lot of talent there. There's a lot of competition. So, yeah. All right, our next reserve is Lexi Miller of Wiley. We've been talking about good passers. How about Miller, 558 assists on the year? Yeah, I mean, she had a, a tremendous season. You mentioned that assist number. That's a huge number. Uh, but uh, the, the thing about her was she was kind of the lone setter for that offense. She ran that offense for them and did a, did a really nice job for Coach Shea Cox. Uh, she had the 558 assists, also had 182 digs and 29 blocks. But just a really smart player, a really consistent player. And she was a big part of the success that Wiley had this year. They, they, they finished second in their district and, 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 and may have made a playoff run had they not gotten matched up with, with Canyon Randall right off the bat. And they played them really well. So uh, a really good uh, season for her this year. And she's just a junior, so she'll be back. All right. Our final reserve is Kylie Phillips of Wall, a five foot seven senior defensive specialist, outside hitter, uh, 11 digs per match. Uh, that's a nice number, but she was also effective on the front line, Dan. Yeah, 5.3 kills and to go with a, with a, an ace and a half per match. 
just a, a really good impact player. One thing that I liked about her is that uh, is, is that her coach mentioned that, uh, that, that, that this was the first year where maybe she she wasn't the most talented or best player on the team, and she kind of had to adjust to that role. And I, and then she was talking about just what a selfless player she was for that team, and, and just all of this all of the really uh, you know, the good leadership she provided. I think that's kind of a neat testament to her because she is a very talented and, and excellent volleyball player, but it, it can be tough when you've been the best player on your team basically your entire career and then kind of have to adjust to, to, to having a, a young kid there who, who kind of takes that mantle. So that, that I think speaks to both her maturity and her character in addition to the skills, which, which you see in those numbers. That's why she made the, uh, the max effort roster. Our, she's uh, one of the members of our max effort team, which is the first this year, the, the first time we've run it for volleyball. All right, that's just about going to wrap it up for volleyball and our All-Big Country Preps volleyball team for 2020. We remind you that we have a second team and a third team. The links are available right there on the website so you can jump in and take a look at those teams. We also have the Big Country Preps Max Effort Team where we celebrate the hardest working, best teammates in the Big Country. Nobody else honors these people, but we do. Yeah, make sure you do check those out. There are a lot of really good players on those second and third teams and a lot of really good individuals as well. That max effort team is, is something I think you and I are both real proud of. It gives us an opportunity to honor some of those girls who are just really good teammates, really good players, show up and, and do all the things right. So so do check out the site, uh, BigCountryPreps.com, and check out those links. And now we're going to go ahead and, and shift our focus a little bit to basketball. It's something I know that you and I are excited to talk about. We're, we're finally kind of getting to dive headlong into that. Uh, so should have a, a fun discussion tonight. Before we do that, we're going to thank some of our sponsors. First and foremost, Capital Farm Credit, who brings you these Wednesday night podcasts free of charge throughout the school year. Also, for the love of the game broadcasting, our old friend Terry Slavens, owner of K Lakes 93.5 FM out of Breckenridge, 97.7 FM KATX out of Eastland, Classic Country 1330 AM out of Graham, 94.7 FM KWKQ out of Graham, KRO 1430 AM out of Breck, and KWBY 98.5 FM out of Ranger. That's for the love of the game broadcasting. Also, Phil Hill of the Abilene Realtors Group, big supporter of local athletics. If you're in the market, give him a shout at 325-669-5153 or visit his website at philhillproperties.com. And finally, the Four Sand Oil Patch Cafe. You know, every little town in the Bay Country has that one place where everybody tells you that's the place to go. That's the place to eat. Well, in Four Sand, it is the Oil Patch Cafe. Some of the best home cooking that you'll ever have. Big supporters of the Four Sand Buffaloes. Check it out. That is the Four Sand Oil Patch Cafe. And with that, we're going to jump headlong into basketball. Class 1A, we're going to start on the girls' side. And this is not atypical. This is not unusual. Dan, Class 1A on the girls' side in the big country uh, is loaded. We are well represented. Yeah, uh, seven big country teams in the TABC Top 25, and some of them are kind of the usual suspects. You look at uh, at number three, you've got Huckabee, which entered this week at 13 and two. Number six, Eula, which is one of those programs that's always right around you know the top 15, top 10. They're at number six this year, entered this week at 14 and five. Number nine, May, another team that's kind of become a region tournament regular. Uh, number 15, Westbrook, which is uh, having a, a great season on both the boys' and girls' side so far. Number 18, Monday, which was a team I got to see last year as a really young team. You can kind of tell that they, that they had big things in front of them. Uh, they entered this week at 19 and 3. Number 22, Highland at 13 and 8. And Robert Lee at number 25, rounding out the top 25. But these are, are, are seven programs from our area that are, that are getting a lot of respect for what they've done so far at the Class 1A level. And, uh, that, that's one that's going to be fun. That's one we always follow really closely because uh, the, the region tournaments are, 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 generally speaking, there's usually one right here in town where we get to see some of those teams. And then, uh, and then and others, EULA has been in, in region three at different times. So uh, it, it's always fun because it seems like we always, in the class 1A level, both boys and girls have a team or two that looks like it has at least a chance to get to state. Yes, and this year on the boys' side, it's no different. Uh, right up there, the Jayton Jaybirds start the list at number 11 at 15 and 2. Are they underrated here? I have the feeling they are. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. We'll, we'll find out. I think that's obviously a, a very good basketball team. They did lose Scoggin from last year, who was such a big part of that program. But they've still got a bunch of the players that, that were responsible when you talk about kids like Pecos Smith and, and, and Trip Scott and some of those other kids that have done really big things for two straight uh, state tournament team. So uh, I think that Jayton, to me, I think you're right. I think that team probably deserves a little more respect than it's getting at number 11 based to, just on what they brought back from two teams that, that had made it to the state tournament. But 
that's the great thing about basketball and, and the great thing about high school sports in general is they get to prove this on the court. So, so we'll get to find out exactly how good they are as they round up, wrap up district and enter the playoffs. All right, and rounding out the top 25 uh, in the TABC rankings on the boys' side, Class 1A, Westbrook at number 13 at 12 and 3. We've got Eula at number 15, 11 and 9. We've got Lingleville at 12 and 5. They're ranked 20th. Yeah, and these, again, are some of those usual suspect-type programs. We talked about Jayton, obviously. Eula's another one of those that's always kind of in that mix. Uh, and it's, it's neat to see Westbrook again. Uh, in the in ranked highly on both the boys and girls side. All right, let's jump back over to the girls side, class 2A. This looks like San Sabagier right now. They're 20 and 0 on the girls side, ranked number three. We've got Haskell at number 15 at 16 and 2. They look underrated to me. Can you picture 14 teams better than Haskell? No, no, I can't. And I got to see Haskell earlier this season. I saw them go to Anson and beat a really good Anson team pretty soundly. Uh, actually really soundly. It was, it, was, it was a dominating performance for them. So uh, this Maidens team is really strong. Once again, that's a really good program. That's one that, that's kind of uh, in that mix in the regionals. Uh, it seems like uh, each and every year, at least to, 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 you know, the third, third round, trying to get into the fourth round and, and deeper. But uh, this is a good program that I think is, has been on the rise for a while and it's continuing to try to get to the next step. So this will be interesting to see if this is that team that can do that. The one thing that I think that, that speaks really highly of this Haskell team, which entered this week at 16 and two overall, nine and zero in District 10 2 A, is that they've done this out of a out of a district that is really really strong. You look at the other teams in that district, Stamford, which was a region tournament team last year, they're second right now at 13 and five, or entered the, the week anyway at 13 and five, seven and two district. That Anson team we talked about is 17 and three entering the week, and then. I think this tells you the strength of that district is Cisco, who we all know is a really good program and has another strong team this year is fourth uh, coming into the week at four and four. So for Haskell to have entered this week undefeated in that district, I think it tells you the type of team they have. All right. Speaking of teams that are underrated, let's go over to the boys side class two a, we have a San Saba team uh, that, uh, you know, grad, you know, granted they, they lost some key players last year, but we're talking about a program that reached the state tournament. Now COVID ended that for everybody, but uh, a San Saba program that reached the state tournament last year, they are off to a 13 and three start. They're seven and zero in district and they're not ranked. There's 25 teams better than them. I don't think so. No, I think if you ask coach Kyle, that's probably right where they want to be. This is exactly where they were last year in terms of just being under the radar going into the playoffs. I think they kind of like that, that uh, being underestimated. That's kind of a position they've succeeded out of in the past. No one expected last year's team to do what it did. And then they've brought back enough pieces from that team. They've got some really good players back from that team. Uh, obviously, you look at the record, that, that kind of tells you the type of team they have. So, uh, yeah, the San Saba boys, I think, have a chance to, to really do some damage. And that's another one of those programs that you see on both the boys' and girls' side doing special things. You talked about the girls who, who are number three at 20-0. and 0. Uh, and really the biggest obstacle I think for them right now is, is a Mason team that they beat by one point the first time they faced in district. So a couple of really good teams over at San Sab, but they've got a lot to, uh, to be excited about right now. Okay. One other thing to take a, a quick look at and a close eye on in class 2A is district 8 2A where we've got a very interesting race for first place between winners and Coleman. Yeah, it's a really fun race. Those two teams played uh, have played once already with Winters taking a one-point win. They've got another matchup coming in the last uh, week of district, so that, that should be a really fun one that's going to be a lot riding on that. Uh, Winters entered this week at 17-4 and four overall at 5-1 and one in district. Coleman, meanwhile, was 11-6 and six and 4-1, and one. so there's a good chance that that last matchup could be for the district title outright, so that's, that's kind of a neat uh, a race that's brewing between two teams that have really been solid all year long. Uh, Winters, I mentioned their record, uh, just a team that, that's had some, some really nice wins. And then Coleman, I think the interesting thing about that program is that this basketball season has kind of uh, been a continuation of, of the progress they made during football season with a really strong senior class. That, that's a group that, that made huge strides in football season. Unfortunately, they, they would have qualified for the playoffs but didn't get to compete in the playoffs because of COVID. Uh, a lot of those same players are on this basketball team and, and they're going to get a chance now to go play in the postseason. So that, right. that's a fun story there. And that's one of a couple of, of really good races at the 2A level. One other one uh, that we can just mention briefly in 10 2A, you've got a pretty nice district race uh, uh, brewing between uh, Cisco team, which is entered the week at 10 and three and six and one 
and an Anson team that's only 10 and nine overall, but they're five and one in district and really seem to be hitting their stride. Uh, and Anson was able to knock off Cisco last week. So that, that, that's, that's looking like it could shape up to be a pretty nice district race as well. Not a single class two, a boys team from our area is in the top 25, not one that is, I'm sorry, but that's baloney. Yeah. I, I tend to agree. And I think you can make a strong case for a couple of those teams. Uh, I think uh, San Saba is one that obviously based on what they did last year, what they brought back and how they started this year could be in that mix. Cisco, particularly prior to last week's loss to Anson was playing really, really well. So there are a couple of those teams that, that definitely have a, a, a uh, you know, a, a gripe probably, but, at the same time, the rankings are what they are. Just go play and win games. I know that's kind of the mentality that most of our teams have. I don't take that viewpoint. I like to gripe. So <laughs> now let's go to class three. And speaking of baloney, we have Jim, Ned, and Wall. They're both 18 and two, and they're ranked 14th and 15th. I do not believe. Now, I'm not saying they win a state championship. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's not 13 teams that are better than them. I don't believe that. They're both 18 and two. They both play very good, solid, competitive schedules. No, yeah. I don't think so. Again, and this is and this is where I'll gripe because yeah, I, I agree. I, that, that to me, I don't know how you can make a case that there are you know thirteen teams better than those two. Though those are two really really good teams um, that, that have been playing well all year. So I mean, in, in two two programs that I think have, have probably earned probably a little more respect than they're getting with those two rankings. But the good thing about that is is that those two teams are going to get to prove themselves. I, I think there's a, there's a good chance that you could see. Another instance where those two teams are playing in a region tournament, which is not, uh, which has been a common uh, theme in, in the past between those two. These are two programs that in our, then in our region have pretty much been among those gold standard programs. And I think that's definitely the case again. Okay, we're going to jump over to the boys' side. Uh, no surprise here. Brock off to a 17 and 2 start. This is a regional team from a year ago. Uh, very well coached, very well disciplined. Uh, here they are at 17 and two and have another shot at getting to state in my opinion. Yeah. I, I don't think you, anyone could, could really quibble with that. I mean, you look at what they've done this year to go 17 and two last week, uh, got a big win over number three Peaster, which is not only a, a region rival. I mean, that's, that's really one of their main rivals. So to get that district win over that team in the fashion they did, I think speaks to just how good this Brock team is this year. And uh, that's one of those programs that you kind of expect to be playing late, you know, late into the season, into, into the region tournament and beyond. And I would not be at all surprised to see this team close its season in a state tournament. Three teams from our area to, to take a quick look at, and none of them are ranked. Wall, Jim Ned, and Ballinger. Ballinger's only lost twice, uh, and they're unranked. Jim Ned has gotten all that football talent back. Now, granted, they're off to a slow start, but they've got their talent. So keep an eye on that ball club. Yeah, keep an eye on that in district race in general. District 6-3A, if there's a more competitive district in the state, I would love to see it. You're talking about four teams that entered this week, uh, basically a game apart. Wall was leading the district at 7-1 and one coming into the week, but you had Ballinger, Jim Ned, and TLCA from St. Angelo right behind them at 6-2. and two. Uh, So you're talking about at this stage, there are still four teams that could legitimately win that district title, and all four of them are really good teams. Like you said, you're not going to find any of those teams in the rankings. But these are good basketball teams. Jim Ned started slow because they didn't have much of their team. Uh, football season ended. They got some of those guys back. They got a transfer from Cooper, Caden Davis in the post, who's, a, who's an impact player. And they're playing really, really well right now. I got to see Ballinger early this season against Clyde. And that Ballinger team plays some really, really tough pressure defense, has uh, a couple of really good offensive players that, that, uh, that, that finish really well around the rim. And then TLCA is one of those programs that's been good for a while now. So, uh, you throw those in the same district as a wall, and you're talking about a pretty, uh, a pretty, pretty salty district there. So that that's one that if, if if I was watching down the stretch, that's that's a district race to follow. And here's the thing about that district too: I think there's a very good chance that all four of those teams that make the playoffs will be playing past the first round. So I, I think that there's a good chance that if you get matched up with any one of those four teams in the first round of the playoffs, you're not you're not liking your chances. Yeah, one more ball club we want to mention here tonight uh, on the girls' side. Stephenville is off to one of its best starts uh, in recent memory. This is an outstanding team that is really playing at a dominant level. Uh, they're currently ranked fifth at 17-1, and one, and they're in good company. Harden Jefferson's 20-0 and 0 at one, number one. Canyon's up there at 19-1. and one. Fredericksburg at 21-1. and one. Sunnyvale at 21-1. and one. And right behind them, their district mate at number six, Glen Rose at 21-2. and two. Yeah, that's a really good team that played a really strong schedule 
to, to prepare themselves for district in the playoffs. And to, to have that record, I think, tells you the type of team they have. And uh, one of the big things for them is, is they've got a lot of experience, but one of the big things is they got Allie McClendon back in the post. She hurt her knee last year and missed much of the season. She had a really nice volleyball season for, for the volleyball team, and now she's doing big things again, uh, you know, on the block for, for that Seedonville team. And that's just a really deep, talented team that has talent at, at, I mean, at the guard position. They've got in, in McClendon one of the best posts in the area, and they're playing great basketball. Uh, and obviously the, the, the big thing that this year, they were able to beat Glen Rose the first time they played, and they matched up again on Tuesday. So uh, that that was a, a fun district uh, race to follow there as well. But uh, the Disneyville team has been fun to watch. They've got a, a, a really good group, and it's going to be fun to see what they can do in the playoffs. But uh, that's going to be a tough bracket, too. This is a tough region in 4A, but uh, I like this team. There's there's a lot to like about this team. Okay, now we taped this podcast on Monday night, so we do not know the results of that stephenville Glen Rose matchup. So that's why we're speaking a little behind the time, sir. Yeah, a, a little vague there, but uh, regardless, I mean, whoever wins that matchup, you're talking about two really good basketball teams that have a chance to, to go away in the playoffs. So that's, it's always fun when you have those types of matchups in district. I think those are ones that prepare you really well for the postseason. And that's just about going to wrap things up for this week's Capital Farm Credit Wednesday night podcast. But before we do that, we want to remind you that we have three separate subscription packages here at Big Country Preps. We've got a monthly for five bucks a month. We've got a semi-annual six-month subscription where we knocked that price down to four bucks a month. And we've got an annual 12-month subscription where we knocked the price down to three bucks a month, 36 bucks for a full year of Big Country High School athletic coverage. We'd also like to remind you that if you ever see a photo you like in any one of our galleries, it is available for just $7. You can click that small shopping cart icon at the bottom right, follow that prompt, and purchase as many of those as you would like. But if you've scrolled around the site, you've probably noticed we take a whole lot of photos. That's something we really enjoy doing when we're out at these games. And it's something we're really proud of here at BigCountryPreps.com. All big country, all high school, all the time. Welcome home. Welcome home.